I'm Dean Newland, and welcome to the Business of Intuition, where I coach, facilitate, train, and speak on the hard science and meaningful experience of intuitive leadership in business, so you can make better decisions, forge real connections, and creatively solve problems to amplify your impact and simplify your life. Welcome to the Business of Intuition. If you're wondering whether or not to listen to this next interview, review the next series of statements and see if you answer yes to any of them. And if so, this would be a good one for to check out. For example, our company is organized and behaves in a series of silos that don't really talk to one another. Teams do really not know what other teams do, and therefore they are often at a loss about how to collaborate. Our teams often compete with one another because they are trying to get limited resources. We have a strong, compelling vision and mission, but we wonder whether or not our organization truly, really believes in it and whether or not our vendors and our partners and our community buy into that vision. We put a lot of time and energy and effort into engagement initiatives and making sure that we are an agile type of organization that encourages full participation, individual voices, creativity, et cetera. But we're finding that one of the outcomes is that we're having a hard time making decisions, especially those that are the tough calls. My next guest on the business of intuition is a national and international expert when it comes to the topic around creating company alignment based on the idea of having a really clear and compelling set of narratives that go throughout the organization. These narratives, these intentional tools help create the alignment so that we're all rowing in the same direction without losing the desired effect of creativity, inclusion, and telling the emperor that he or she has no clothes. Dioma Yithara is the author of Strategic Narrative, a simple method that business leaders can use to help everyone to understand their business, get behind it, and believe in it. His company, MetaHelm, guides CEOs, founders, and leadership teams of professional service organizations to gain focus and traction so they build a successful business that they can also love. A former big firm strategy consultant, Dioma has founded four ventures. He is a sought-after senior executive of companies like Alaska Airlines, the Gates Foundation, Generations for Peace, AIG, L'Oreal, Spencer Stewart, Gap, Google, Microsoft, and the U.S. and French governments. Yama teaches and mentors entrepreneurs at startup incubators and at the University of Washington Master of Science in Entrepreneurship, which, by the way, is ranked number three in the United States. Yama Yitra on the business of intuition. Wonderful having you on the show. I'm so glad to be able to have this conversation. And I think that I want to start off with a question that has to do with the complexity that businesses are struggling with these days and and just sort of spinning their wheels. You know, we seem to be so focused on the short term, not so much the long term. And I want to start off with this idea, like, why is achieving alignment so hard? I mean, why do we struggle with this? This is an area that you've really focused on. You're like a a twin brother from a distant mother when it comes to this topic, because I see it and I understand what you're going for. But I really would love to find out what's your take on why why, why achieving this alignment is so tough. And what are the costs when we do? And what are the benefits? um, Excuse me. What are the costs when we don't? And what are the benefits when we do? Well, I like that. That little twist you just had, Tina, because I also see benefits in misalignment. Tell me more. Okay, so this is this quick intro to to uh, to answer your question, but I think that I see alignment and misalignment as a continuum. You know, it's easy to understand this way, and, and in my book, I even represent it visually with arrows that goes different direction. But if you think about the way we humans work at a basic level, we have all this appetite and this need for belonging and going and walking in the same directions, being part of a movement, being part of a community. So it's no surprise if our traditional organizations replicate this just basic, you know, way to function. Mm. But in some 
in at some moment, at some times, we actually need to disagree. We need to misalign. We need to to diverge, to go further, explore different point of views. What's I think what's I guess what's negative is when we are all misaligned at times where we should be aligned and vice versa. You know, so I'd like to answer your your, your question by putting this into context. Like when is it that we need to go all direction and when is it that we need to be together? And I think you're right. You know, in, in most cases, what we're looking for is this alignment to go faster, to go to go leaner, to save cost, and, and just, you know, to, to onboard the right people that we want to work with, for instance. So, so it sounds like what you're saying is that it's almost a sequence. There's a process here. So you might yeah. start off with, you know, the old adage of, you know, storming and forming and norming, you know, and we've had those models in the past where you're, you're creating a team and you're, you're just brainstorming. And this can obviously be, be blown up on a larger organization as well. But the misalignment could almost be a indication of agility, of divergent okay. thought, of inclusion, of creativity, of what if scenarios. But at some point, if I'm following your train of thought here, that we need to come to alignment in order to be able to be efficient. And I, th- I sometimes see, and what, what your thoughts are, is that the, the, the idea of an agile co- a company almost is so swayed into this misalignment model that mm-hmm. we don't ever get to an aligned perspective. And yes. Thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely right, Dean. I think I think it's it's what's causing trouble is like when it's completely unintentional. It's not mm-hmm. understood, or or we're not even uh, worse. Like we're not even aware. I work with CEOs, you know, who go, yeah, we are all aligned. Like yeah, we we worked on this thing, you know, for a long time, and we all know where we're going. And then you ask people around, and <laughs> it's a completely different picture, right? So so I think you know to your point, it's unintentional. Un- Inconscious, we don't, we're not aware of it, and, and we, we, it's hard for a group to realize that, yeah, actually, we, we're so divergent here, but we even have a hard time understanding and realizing that we are divergent. That's what, co- that's what's really causing, you know, mo- most, most problems here. So it sounds good to say we want to be aligned, but is there almost a, I mean, a subconscious reaction in some people that alignment is bad because it could mean compliance, it could be that I've lost my voice. It could mean that I'm just a cog in a wheel and therefore I have to follow like what everyone else is doing. Do we sort of have that subconscious idea that alignment is almost like a swear word? I think in, in some types of organizations, I've seen, you know, mo- modern organizations, you probably, I don't know if you, you've heard of the, the TL movement and TL organizations are organizations that grow very organically and they the, the metaphor for the for this type of organization is the metaphor of a tree, right? A tree is by nature goes try to grow, you know, different directions, but knows when to stop and knows when to adapt and to. It's almost like I might stretch the metaphor here a bit, but knows when to get rid of some of limbs, even right, to survive. And so, in these types of organizations too much conformity and too much and, and you know seeing everybody as exactly working in, in the same direction is perceived as negative because it means that it goes against the nature of the organization we're losing ideas we're losing agility we're losing creativity as you said earlier and that's detrimental to this to the the purpose of the company and its survival um, in other companies more traditional built with the machine con- command and control narrative, what I call a narrative, that's where we want everybody to look the same, everybody to behave the same, everybody to, to be compliant. The problem is these days we're feeling and seeing that there is a higher need for change, innovation. And how can you possibly ask people to just be all compliant and then just on the whim be creative and divergent? <laughs> We're not robots here, right. so it creates a lot of tension, right? So, so when an employee or a leader, mm. this is a rhetorical question, I guess. So, <laughs> apologies for this, but I'm just following your train of thought here that we would need to know when to be aligned and when to be divergent, when to pull together and create decision, and when we need to challenge those decisions, when we need to 
play upon those old models of command and control, not in the way that we would be command and control, but alignment from that perspective. And when we need to go off and be able to create challenging new thought and engage new perspectives. And I, I wonder if you think that the, the, the value and the, the, the phase we are in business, which is heavy on engagement, heavy on agility, heavy on inclusion, the all fine things, have we lost the ability to align? Have those, mm, sorry for saying this, those movements yeah. made alignment more difficult or, or not? What's your thought? I think it's very likely. I think we are coming into an era of another, we're, we're going another direction and we're experimenting. I mean, this, I'm over generalizing here, but I, of course, yeah. but, I, but I see this like, yeah, you know, oh, you're free. You're, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to, you can take as much vacation as you want. I used to work in this consulting firm where I could take as, as, as much vacation as I wanted, you know, on, on paper, in theory. It never, it, it actually never works, right? We, I, you know, most people that uh, really use that policy all reported after a few years that it all felt extremely bad about it because <laughs> mm. they felt guilty, right? So I think we're, we're experimenting different things. I, I want to use another metaphor. I'm a metaphor guy, Dean, in case Good. you didn't use this because <laughs> I'm a storyteller and I build narratives. So that's my day-to-day -day job. But I'm a jazz musician. I'm a jazz artist. I play the piano, the trumpet. I sing a little bit. And, and the metaphor of a jazz orchestra is, is just has a lot of potential for what we, how we need to rethink our organizations now. Jazz orchestras have the power to be extremely structured and aligned and extremely free. And I remember my piano teacher in the conservatory who would always remind me, you know, like Guillaume, always keep in mind extreme precision and extreme freedom when whatever you play, right? So being able to extremely be, pre be e extremely precise with the tempo and then at the same time when it was your uh, chance to go free and have a chorus of your own, you could just go wherever you are. And if you, if you look at um, the masters in jazz, master, you know, jazz musicians, that's exactly the principles they apply. And I think we've got a lot to learn here with this, uh, with this art and, and this metaphor, the art of improvisation. Most people think of improvisation is just whatever. Because it sounds like whatever. It's just like, yeah, it's just chaos. Like, you know, it doesn't mean anything. No, actually, improvisation is, a, is, is the art of alignment, right? And then all of a sudden, extreme freedom. But the freedom is within the barriers or boundaries of whatever art you're going for. Yes, yes, there is tempo, there, are, there is a certain number of bars, there is, there is a melody, there, are, there is all sorts of, of, of things that create this very firm structure that, you know, it, it's a song, it's a tune, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's typically a classic standard, you know, melody that everybody knows that such as if you don't respect the structure, you can be, uh, people will take you or make you accountable. They will know exactly that you're messing with the structure as you're free. So I was thinking about, I went and saw a play for the first time in Minneapolis at the Guthrie Theater, wonderful experience getting back to my roots. And I was recalling a play that I saw in uh, London with James Earl Jones playing Big Daddy in Canada Hot Tin Roof. And I was watching the other actors act with this master and I could see that there was the structure, obviously play, plays have words and, you know, lines and, and, and blocking, meaning you have to move to certain places and certain gestures and so forth. But you could see that he was going outside of, of some of that structure. He was improvising yeah. because I could see the surprise in the eyes of the other actors. Like, whoa, where did that come from? And it was delightful to watch them be surprised by what was going on as anybody would in a real situation that this particular play was depicting. So how do we then incorporate this wonderful metaphor around theater and jazz into, into business? Meaning that we have structure. And yet at the same time, we have improvisation. How do we, how do we build that? How do we structure for the structure and the improvisation? Well, th that's a great question. The, uh, j just like an orchestra or theater gr group, theater group of theater actors, the company has, has a direction, has a purpose. Like there is a reason why a company exists. And, and a company should have a strategy, should have 
some ideas of where the ship is going, right? So, so that's the meta structure. That's the meta helm. Uh, that's that's where we want to go at a at a higher level. Is what are we here to do? What are we here to achieve? And then within that larger structure, there are pockets of of and in areas and moments where we can just go improvise and go create and and then get back to okay, well that was that was great. We fixed X Y Z problems. We discovered these things. And by and and by the way, we were able to be who we are and just you know come to work with our own intuition and creativity and senses. Uh, but how do we get back to okay? Where are we taking this as a group, right? Because we want this to mm. to, to to continue and survive. So that's how we apply this metaphor to organizations. And the one of the one of the phenomena I've observed now for you know that pretty much since I I started working for uh, other companies is what I call building a narrative. A narrative is is almost unconscious. Like we everybody knows and guess why you are in your in your organization. Like what's the what's the point of your of of a company? Like, you know, if we take your company Dean, you 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 probably can sense that. And you 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 founded this company and you started it with a key idea in mind. And that's that's and you created a narrative then. It was not necessarily written and documented, but the way you behaved, your words, everything contributed to give that sense of direction to people. And that sense of direction needs to be uh, continuously repeated and renewed and revisited. You see this very much in uh, religious organizations. There is a reason why we go to church every Sunday. <laughs> you hear the narrative. You hear the narrative. And to to experience the narrative, there is a, there is a reason why there is a calendar, and same thing for Muslims and uh, and Jewish people and all all religion. If you if and now if you if you start with that in, with that mindset, you look at you look around. Everything is organized the same way. Civiliz- entire civilizations are built around narratives, right? Narratives are systems of stories and practices and norms, not just what we say. It's, and it's actually most Mostly, most importantly, what we do, we, how we walk our talk. Isn't a, a narrative going to be created regardless of whether you intend for it to or not? Yes. So you, you either allow for the narrative to happen nilly willy without you doing anything about it, or yes. you get out in front and you intentional what, be intentional about what that narrative is. 100%. Dean. So how does it, I love where you're heading on this, and I wanted to bring this back now that we've sort of talked about alignment, we talked about the costs and the benefits and Used metaphor with respect to jazz and you know great actors out of London, but now that we're getting into this area around narrative, tell me about how a story or a or an intentional narrative helps build alignment. Bring that into the practicality of, of connecting those dots. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so let's first start with the basics. I may sound like I'm I'm giving a crash course here. Sorry, but the basics. Hey, we love it. Most people think story and narrative are the same. And one one evening, long time ago, I had the intuition that they were not. Okay. Because I could catch myself uh, using those two words interchangeably as synonym. I was, I was writing an article that night. I'm like, wait a minute. What's the... What? <laughs> it's so funny sometimes, those little distinctions that kind of go unnoticed. And then you go, your intuition tells you, go there. Mm. A story is... I'll make it very simple. A story is a finite unit that creates meaning it has a beginning a middle and an end right most people will rec- will will see this pattern it's been very well documented you know uh, by great researchers and writers such as joseph campbell mm-hmm. a narrative is an open-ended system a narrative has a beginning a middle but not really an end it's like a modus operandi if you will we talk about the narrative in society the narrative about economics the narrative about startup xyz narrative the narrative about recycling there is a narrative everywhere you go because narratives are essential to uh, they're essential to human life they they give us shortcuts for what we will do in our day uh in professional services firms which are the 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 firms i I focus on helping they are really great narrative and sometimes toxic narrative as you said if you if you if you let the narrative happen without any intention you could be lucky or it can become a toxic narrative. For instance, some firms will declare that they are experts 
they'll say on their website, yeah, we know this very, very well. We are expert at, at all those items. But when you see them behave in their processes, operations, the way they sell, they communicate, they actually, they actually behave as the opposite, as vendors, as order takers. They'll do whatever the client wants. Expert, experts don't do that. Experts have a process. Experts have repeatedly you know, done the procedures that they sell. They, they've done it so many times that they know it by heart. They can very quickly guess what's going to work or not. They will probably ask you to do a diagnose, some, some form of diagnostic here. But that, so being conscious of what is the narrative that you want to build within your, your organization is really what's at stake here. So stories and narratives are different. Again, narratives are system of stories. Uh, the other distinction I want to bring here is when people think of story, they think communication. Uh, they think, yeah, yeah uh, I'm going to give a pitch. I'm going I'm to communicate. I'm going to do a presentation, which is true. Great presentations use storytelling uh, very, very, very well, very smartly. Uh, people like uh, Nancy Durarte has written books about it. Brilliant work. She even has a visual that tells you, you know, that the difference between what it is, what it could be, and it's all documented there. That's only one part of a narrative. A narrative starts with an intention. You want to you wanna do something. You, you have this idea. You see the future. You go, oh, yeah, we're going to launch this service, or we're going to become this firm, or I'm going to market my, uh, my company this way. That's an intention. It's just, it's just a guess. It's just a hypothesis, right? You're trying just, you're just in planning. Then comes the time where you go into practicing, and that's when the narrative really, it's in the execution of things, right? And so building this narrative intentionally and consciously is a constant dance between going on what uh, Ron Heifetz, you know, the founder of Adaptive Leadership calls, going on the dance floor, so be, being, you know, in the day-to-day -day operations, uh, walking the talk, and really uh, demonstrating the narrative and then being able to pull back and get on what he calls the balcony, which is you go up and you observe. And the first thing you should be doing there is having the courage to diagnose what you see, your actions, uh, and see if that narrative is really coherent with what you, you set to do. Only then, only, only once you've repeated this back and forth a few times, can you really prove that your narrative is now has become culture has become an, you know a norm like people know it like yeah when we work with dean um this this is the way things happen around dean <laughs> and his team right we we don't we don't we don't debate it we don't uh, there's no guess it, these are the conventions and the norm until the culture needs to evolve and the narrative that once used to be great and new and modern is now becoming toxic, now becoming an old, anxious thing that you want to get rid of. So I'll, po I'll pose here with my crash course. <laughs> oh, it's good. Yeah, we'll, we'll test the listeners later. I would assume that there's probably a series of potential blind spots when it comes to owners of companies or leaders in organizations that they think that they have the right narrative, but they don't. How do you, how do you find those blind spots? How do you help give them the the window or that they were in the mirror that says this is what you think that people think that the narrative is this is what it really is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well the uh i typically well that's my work too that's my job to, to first of all do that so you know they bring me as an outsider and um and it works really well especially with my my french accent here in the u.s i i, I can so, ask yeah. <laughs> I can ask like dumb questions like, I don't understand. What are you trying? Je ne comprends pas. I don't understand. I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Exactly. <laughs> but that, but jo joke aside, Dean, um, yeah. I, I play a little bit of the, you know, the, the candid here, there. And I, and, and really when, when I scratch the surface, so scratching the surface is one piece of advice. Asking for some third party, you know, feedback is another. And then I also give people a map. Uh, a narrative is the scope of a narrative goes from inside your company. We talked a lot about the inside together, Dean, today, to yeah. the outside. It's also the marketing, the branding, the PR efforts that you do, where you go speak, and so on. 
and these two uh, these two facets are typically disconnected, right? It's it's a uh, yeah, I, that, that's a that's a typical gap here. So that that's a hard that's a hard that's a sorry that's an easy one to to be able to notice. Like you look at what's on the outside and go inside and go oh well, uh, and and people will turn around like oh yeah that thing on our website yeah the marketing department put that we don't do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that, that that's that's an example here. And then there is another dimension which is how do we operate collectively and how do I show up individually and. Uh, um, many years ago, I felt like this was really a, a missing dimension in my work. Uh, that we, when we do narrative work, we most of the time speak about together. How do we align? How do we communicate? But very, very importantly, how you show up as a leader and how you listen to the narrative inside your mind or your heart, your intuition plays a huge role, right? So that's one of the blind spots here that leaders should really consider is are they going to be able to uh to match those two uh and i have i know i often ask the questions to say how excited are you about the the work that you're doing what are the what are the things that you're putting in place to continuously um, manage your inner chatter and narrative right Uh, as a leader as a colleague but also with yourself I work with a lot with many company founders, and uh, and and the founders really have the they're full of energy. They they go through those cycles. I'm a company founder. I'm a, I, I founded four companies, and I experienced it myself too. We go through those cycles, and then we have amnesia. We forget, forget really yeah. the moments when I don't know if that happens to you, but I see this with myself and and other of my peers. We forget why in the first place we did things, and so. And the, so the chatter that we have, the narrative inside can potentially become a little cluttered, blurry, uh, unclear. And yet we need to be the next day, we need to be in front of people and just lead the boat and create that alignment that we all trying to build. <laughs> so around the alignment idea, again, going back to that first part of our conversation and tying in the, the narrative. I'm thinking about a book in a process that has to do with something that Amazon has gotten really good at with just working backwards. And they've got a book I'll yes. call that by the same name. And it just so happens that I would think that way even before the book was published. And so we kind of design our strategic planning and our culture and our leadership development work around what's our future state that we're trying to head and how do we then fill the gap? And then the process becomes around that. Is that the same with what you do? Do you also s- sort of look at the the intentional future that we're trying to create and then build a narrative around that and the alignment around that? Or does it come at a different process? Does it come organically through another sequence? No, it's included in my process. Uh, There are four areas that I look at. The first one is leadership. The second one's marketing. The third one is teams and operations. And the fourth one is sales. And in each of the areas, I look at past, present, and future. And when it comes to developing products, the method that you're talking about, working backwards, is part of the uh, of the methodology. It's actually, actually I, I I use it and I name it. And hey, I'm I'm based in Seattle, so I know people who've actually uh, used it. You know, at, at Amazon in the in the early days of Amazon, and I recommend it. You know, being able to describe what the future looks like and then working backward is absolutely part of the process of building a strategic narrative. But here is the thing. And maybe that's what you've done with your company, Dean. It's great to do it for products, but in a way, and I'm sure I'm sure you'd see the value here is what if you did it? What if you did the same for yourself as a leader? Yes. What kind of leader do I want to be? You know, what do I need to get to get there? Right. Same for your team. Same for your your company's perspective, your unique point of view and intellectual proper, property, right? What what do we want this thing to become? We don't have all the articles and the proof and the research, but we have a guess, we have an intuition that in the future, our point of view in the market will be ABC, right? Now, how, do we, how could we get there? What, what do we need to find out to, to, to see if it's really true and adjust accordingly? And then the, the, the last area is really the vision for your, your like, here's a distinction. <laughs> there is the business, the, there's the vision for your business and there is your business vision. And I was going to talk about your business vision. Both to me are different. 
the business for the vision for your business is the vision you have for your organizations. Where do you want it to go in three, ten, five years, whatever? And then here is what most people miss. I, I just I would I wish I, I would see more people with that a business vision, which is really your view of what the world around you, your, the community you serve, could become in the future. Like what? How do you see the world evolve around you and what are the opportunities that you see that other people didn't see yet? And, and, and you can really tell the difference between leaders who have, who will only talk about their business. And I, they, they've got this really big, what I call the brag zone, right? They, they can talk, they can say everything about their business, uh, how great they are, how many awards. And uh, you ask them, okay, what's your, what's your business vision? And they'll, they'll instantly turn to that which is a good thing to do, but it's not just that. And then you kind of challenge them on, all right, what's the future for your industry? How do you feel like your work can impact your, your, the community here? Um, and that's where they fall short. They, 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 they fall short, really. So, so I, wish, I wish more people would. So there, I mean, I, I'm almost there with you, almost there with you. So I get it that, that the owners, the, the stakeholders may have a vision for the business. We want X, Y, Z within X, Y, and Z months, years, days, whatever. You know, and you know, I, I think what you're trying to say, tell me if I got this right, is that when you talk about the business vision, uh -huh. that's the other distinction, takes into account more things, the environment, the economy, the social change, uh, politics, almost like if you were to this is my analogy. So let's go back to analogy. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that the business is a living person that could talk and has eyes and ears it can see around itself. Whereas the owner could say, I want this for my child. I want you to go to college and be a doctor, right? Now you ask the child, well, what do you want? What, 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 in your world, what are you seeing? And, and where do you want to grow? Is that a, an analogy that works for what you're trying to say? I love it. I'm going to steal that from you, Dean. Oh, you got it. <laughs> it's better than my, my lengthy explanation before. No, I, I just, I, I, uh, simple mind sometimes needs to break it down into little bits. Oh, this is great. So, uh, you mentioned the individual and their, their vision, their narrative as well. What you've obviously sort of indicated is that you just don't have one narrative for an organization, whereby you might have one vision statement, which sometimes people might actually sometimes misconstrue by what you're saying, or a branding. Uh, statement or um, you know so forth, but you're saying that the the narrative isn't there isn't just one, and I'm assuming what you're going to tell me is that that the d sales would have a narrative, uh, marketing might have a narrative, uh, this team may have a narrative, this leader may have a narrative that are all unique in, unto themselves, but they all align to the narrative for the organization. Is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. As I said before, this is a system. Whereas a story is just a one is a is a is one entity. I'll go back to religion, for instance. You know, the, in the in the Bible, there is many characters, and they all come with a different narrative. And some of them are more sales oriented. Some of them are more operations oriented. <laughs> some of them are more evil. We all come together, but we have to work together. We have to make this happen. So yes, a, a company has um, has several narratives. So again, I broke it down into four areas. Uh, to make it simple, because as you can see, a, this system can be quite complex. Uh, I broke it down into four areas. What's happening in the leadership? What's happening uh, around marketing, which is my definition is everything you, you do to, to be outside, out there. Uh, what's happening in your team and what's happening at the sales level. And also when you, we, when you help people, when you help your client individually. So these are the four main areas. Once you have this map, things become a lot clearer and you can see the interactions and you can see where to focus and where you can get more value and where you should let uh, misalignment happen and actually uh, enforce alignment. So I, I really love what you what you're all about. I just think it's, um, there's so many organizations that are just into execution or into creating strategy. There's not the alignment. They're all working almost like a series of little silos that don't really know what's going on. And they wonder why they're burned out. They wonder why they're not getting the results that they want. And I don't think that we have enough leaders and organizations out there that think from a systems perspective, think from a design perspective. Mm. And I think it takes energy and time and an investment 
in people like you or in just in the energy to do it, to be able to think before you go do and to, and to create those systems by which we would be able to be much more successful, profitable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Great stuff. How can people connect with you, follow what you're all about? Well, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So you'll find me there under my complicated, to s- hard to spell name, but easy to say, Guillaume Viat. But uh, and maybe an easier method is just to go to my company's website, metahelm.com. I, I talked about the concept of Metahelm today. So if you listen to the interview, it'll be yeah. metahelm.com. And you'll find there my uh, free to download ebook. I also have a quick assessment I'd love for more people to take very short four or five minutes set of questions that will uh, help you dig further into the, the concept of strategic narrative. So I hope this helps. Absolutely. Jim, tell me what the, the name of your company again and why did you name it? MetaHelm, M-E-T-A-H-E-L-M. Yeah. I named it that way because Helm is the second part of my name, Guillaume or William in English. And okay. I, I thought, okay. I, I want to leave a little bit of my fingerprint. I don't know what's going to happen that, to that business, but if you know, in just in case. And Meta just, seriously, I, I just thought it was a cool sound at the time, Meta. Okay. It was, it was several years before Facebook turned into Meta. Turned into Meta. Well, I, thought, I sort of began to have this association with Meta, you know, Zuckerberg, right. and then Helm. And I thought, well, okay, now I see this person who's on the back of a boat, you know, with the... And so, and so after that, I thought, and in addition to that, in addition... Yeah, yeah. My job is to guide the guides. So I am the meta helm. And I thought, great, that will work. <laughs> Let's guide the guides. I and, love it. And I also named it this way because the website name was, was available and the trademark, I could trademark the name. I mean, the, these are just little details some people have to think about. Well, don't, ex- don't be surprised if you get a call from uh, Meta saying, hey, we'd like to buy out your website name because we love it so much. <laughs> Not for sale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, hold out until you get, you know, a really big price. Right. Well, it's great to talk to you. Let's stay in exactly. touch. You know, it's, it's wonderful to hear a kindred spirit who understands, um, I think, even more than I do, this whole idea about alignment and around the ability to pivot between structure and the improvisation that you described so well, uh, the narrative being what it is, not a story and being able to have different narratives that align up to a master one within an organization. And lastly, just the whole idea around being intentional about who we want to be, how we want to act, and making sure that we design our organizations, our teams, our own leadership journey around that. So just fantastic work. Thank you so much, Dean. You you get such a great capacity to make a lot of sense of my complex (laughs) here. I'm just impressed. You're very kind. You're very kind. Can I hire you? Oh, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll be up in Seattle. We're going to go to, you know, West Seattle, Al High Point, and we'll go have a cup of coffee or something. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you for listening to The Business of Intuition. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about Dean, or Mission Facilitators Leadership, go to mfileadership.com. That's mfileadership.com.